morning, everyone. Welcome to Christian Worship Center Online. Glad you could join us today. You know, we've been studying the book of 1 Thessalonians, where we continue our study there in that book in chapter 5 this morning. But before we do, let's open up with a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for this opportunity to join our hearts together in worship of you. And we ask that you would just take captive every thought that's going through our mind, bring them into captivity unto you. We ask that you would just send your spirit of peace upon us, comfort our hearts, Lord. Many of us have been going through uh, a trying week, Lord. Some of us have uh, had our fears rise within us, and we just ask that you would just comfort us right now, as only you can do. Lord Jesus, one of your names in the Old Testament is the Prince of Peace. And Lord, since you're the Prince of Peace, give us that peace that surpasses all understanding. Dwell with us today. Guide and direct us as we study your word, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Before we get into the study of the word this morning, let's open up our hearts in a time of worship, shall we?
studying there for the last few weeks. We learned that um, Paul was concerned about the church there in Thessalonica because he had established it, and even though he was there just for a few, few short weeks, uh, about three actually, um, there was an uprising of Jewish believers that chased him and um, threatened him with physical harm, chased him out of Thessalonica, and they rose up against the church as well. He went over to a town called Berea, and there he was there again for just a couple weekends before he was chased out and out of the, uh, the region. 
as he continued his travels, he began to get worried about the church there in Thessalonica. He was worried whether are they growing, do they still love God, do they fall away. So he sends his uh, spiritual brother, Timothy, over to check on Thessalonian church. And while there, he finds out that uh, when Timothy reports back, that the church has really been growing. In fact, people from all over the countryside are hearing great things about the church of Thessalonica, how they love one another, how they care for each other, how they minister the needs of each other, how they've been um, reaching out to those around them in the surrounding towns and neighborhoods and preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. And this excites Paul, and that's why he's writing this letter to tell them that he's hearing these good reports, but also to give them some gentle instruction. And today, last week, well, last week we learned that he was giving them some instruction about the coming of Jesus Christ, at the rapture of taking us to be with Christ in the air, and that that could happen at any moment in the twinkling of an eye. And we looked at that as being an encouragement to cause us to uh, have an urgency for sharing the word of God with each other and those in our community. Give us urgency in missions and reaching out um, and spreading the gospel throughout the world. As well as causing us to live holy lives dedicated unto God. Let's pick up the story over in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 this morning. He wants to move us beyond just the next step of um, the rapture, the imminent return of Jesus Christ. But now he wants us to look at what's called the day of the Lord. And that's mentioned uh, several times throughout scripture, the Old Testament and New. The day of the Lord is the return of Jesus Christ coming with all the saints in his glory and coming back and the great battle of Armageddon is going to take place in the valley of Megiddo uh, at the end of the tribulation period. Now I'm going to begin reading over in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse number 1. He says, Now concerning the times and seasons, brothers, you have no need to have anything written to you. For you yourselves are fully aware that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. When people are saying, this is peace and security, then suddenly destruction will come upon them as labor pains come upon a pregnant woman, and they do not escape. But you are not in darkness, brothers, for that day to surprise you like a thief, for you are all children of light, children of the day. We are not of the night or of darkness. So then, let us not sleep as others do. Let us, be, let us keep awake and be sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who get drunk are drunk at night. But since we belong to the day, let us be sober, having put on the breastplate of faith and love, and for a helmet, the hope of salvation. For God has not destined us for wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, so that whether we are awake or asleep, we might live with him. Therefore, encourage one another and build one another up as you're doing. You know, the day of the Lord is the time when God will come to judge the world and punish the nations. At the same time, God will prepare Israel for the return of Jesus Christ to the earth to establish his kingdom. And he challenges us as well. He challenges us really to do five things here from the word of scripture this morning. Five things to prepare for the return of Jesus Christ. The first is to wait. It says over in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 1 and 2, he says, About the times and seasons, brothers, you do not need anything to be written to you. For you yourselves know very well that the day of the Lord will come just like a thief at the night. You know, the first way to prepare to, is to wait for God, to wait on him. Paul says about the times and the seasons that the people know how to get ready. They're waiting for the return of Christ. They actively wait by living a life that tells others that Jesus Christ is coming. The signs are there. We won't be surprised if we can wait for the return of Jesus because we're watching, we're waiting. Are you waiting for someone? 
Have you ever been waiting for your wife or your children or uh, to get home from work? Have you ever seen perhaps your pet waiting there at the door uh, for that eager expectation that they can see their master coming? I know that's one thing over at our house. We have a small dog, um, a little terrier, and uh, we call him Little Dude. And uh, I know when you hear Little Dude being shouted out in the outside, don't worry, it's not me. My wife's calling. It's just the dog. But she's calling him to come over and see him. You know, when we get home from work and he's there at the door, he uh, is just sitting there waiting expectationally. And as we get closer to that door, he just begins to jump up and down and get all excited. And that's really what this picture is that I want to give you this morning of God's wanting us to be excited, to be waiting for his return, his eminent return for us, his children. He wants us to be excited. He wants us to be doing his work. He wants us to uh, be excited that he's coming for us. He wants us to be waiting. He wants us to be looking out with the expectation that he can come at any moment. We not only need to wait for God, but we also need to watch for God. First Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 3 through 7. He says, when they say peace and security, then suddenly discretion, destruction comes on them, like labor pains come on a pregnant woman, and they will not escape. But you, brothers, are not in the dark for this day to overtake you like a thief. For you are all sons of light and sons of the day. We do not belong to the night or to the darkness. So then, we must not sleep like the rest, but we must stay awake and be serious. For those who fall asleep, who asleep, sleep at night, and those who get drunk are drunk at night. The question here is, what are we watching? We're watching through the predicted signs that we've been told about in the Old and New Testaments. And Paul compares these signs to labor pains. When you see a woman in labor, when she begins to have pains and she's doubling over, when the contractions get closer and closer and closer together, you know that you need to hurry up and get to the hospital, don't you? Well, in the same way, when you see the signs that are mentioned in the Bible of Christ's return, that there would be wars, rumors, wars, people will be shouting and challenging for peace. When you hear of, of worldwide economic uh, Worldwide pandemics, when you hear of nations getting sick, people dying, when you see the signs of Christ returning mentioned in the Bible, such as Israel becoming a nation once again, those are signs that he is returning soon. One of the signs of Israel coming back as a nation, we're told that the, the generation that saw Israel come back as a nation that no one, that someone from that generation that would still be alive at his return. Knowing that um, gives us hope. It gives us peace. We saw that happen back in 1948 when uh, after World War II they established Israel as a country once again. So just as you know that a baby is coming when your wife is having contractions and they're getting closer and closer, so watching the events go on in the world, we know that Christ's return is soon. So we need to be aware that we're getting closer and closer to his return. We don't want to be sleeping. We don't want to find out, surprise, Jesus is here, do we? There are two extremes to be avoided. One is the arrogance of pretending that we have some special knowledge about the future and is coming. Even if it claims, the claims that we have are based on the Bible. The other thing is to live apart from the continual awareness that the day of the Lord is coming. You know, he doesn't want us going up to some mountaintop and uh, all putting on white sheets and waiting for his return as if it's going to come today. That's not what he's asking us to do. He's wanting us to be ready, to be aware that the signs are there and that he's coming soon and that we need to get busy 
going about and doing the work that he's called us to do. The world is caught by surprise because men will not hear God's word or heed God's warning. You see that happening over and over again in Scripture. God warned that the flood was coming, yet only eight people believed or were saved. You see that over in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 20. Lot warned his family that the city would be destroyed, but they wouldn't listen. Genesis chapter 19. Jesus warned that his generation, that Jerusalem would not be, would be destroyed. Over in Luke chapter 21, verse 19, and following forward. And this warning established, uh, enabled uh, believers to escape. But many perished in the siege of Jerusalem. You know, those living in darkness are portrayed as sleeping and being drunk. In this case, sleep and drunkenness pictures someone who is uh, not in touch or in control of his or hers life. When we're asleep, we're pretty much out of touch with the world around us, except for our dreams, it seems. You know, the drunk has lost control of his or her ability to uh, make wise decisions, to coordinate responses. People who do not live in expectation of Christ's coming are likened to sleepers or those who have had too much to drink. Not really in touch with the present or ultimate reality. We, though, are actively awake. But we can't just wait. We must also work. You see, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 8 says, But since we belong to the day, we must be serious and put the armor of faith and love on our chests and put on the helmet the hope of salvation. We're not lazy while we wait. Christians work while waiting for Jesus to return, don't we? Just as a person puts on a uniform as they go to work, we put on the armor of God, which we use while we're living the Christian life. Faith and love act as a breastplate, if you will, that protects the heart. And the hope of salvation is the helmet that guards our mind. Faith is a certain knowledge of God, his promises, his salvation. Love is a yielding to God and joyful salvation, which goes hand in hand with obedience. The breastplate and helmet are the spiritual defense that we have against the world. And with them in place, we shall be ready for the day of Christ's return. We show love, we show faith, the hope of salvation for those who need to know about Jesus Christ. Jesus told many parables that highlighted the rewards of one who would, uh, one would get when we serve him. And he wants us to, uh, he wants to later call us a, as, what's the term, good and faithful servant. We all want to hear that, don't we? And that can only happen if we're continuing to work by serving we not only need to work, we not only need to wait on God. We not only need to have that expectation of his soon return, but we also need to witness. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 9 and 10. For God did not appoint us to wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, so that whether we are awake or asleep, we who live together with him, that we will live together with him. While we're waiting, while we're watching, while we're working, we're also witnessing. And Paul describes a brief summary in the gospel of these verses. He, Paul wanted people to obtain salvation. That would only happen when we witness to others sharing the good news of Jesus Christ with those who have no relationship around us. Believers should encourage and build up one another in the faith because one day we will live with Christ. The simultaneous truths concerning the return of Christ and the resurrection of believers offer hope and meaning to each of us. The flip side of that is that the day of the Lord, God's wrath will be revealed and people need to be saved from the wrath to come by placing their faith and hope in Jesus, don't they? You know, the church needs to spend as much time as possible to let people know about Jesus. That's our ultimate concern today, is to let people know that they have a need for Jesus. While we're waiting, while we're watching, while we're working, while we're witnessing, we also need to worship. Therefore,
therefore, it says in verse 11 of chapter 5, he says, therefore, encourage one another and build each other up as you already are doing. Worship, you see, when done properly, should encourage each Christian and build us up together. It should build our faith. Worship is when we focus on God and he strengthens us and then we can go back out into the world. Worship is a refreshing act for the Christian. As we're waiting, watching, working, witnessing, we're worshiping together as we help each other. Just as we're helping each other now during this pandemic, encouraging one another, calling on the phone, sending an email, sending a text, checking up on each other, doing errands for each other, such as going to the grocery store for those that are most susceptible and picking up food for them and bringing it home or picking up a prescription while we're out. Those are things that we do to encourage one another, to show our love for one another, to build each other up. We also need to be reminding ourselves and others about Jesus' death, about his resurrection, his forgiveness of sin, and his empowerment that he gives us through the Holy Spirit for service. How could we do that on a day-to-day -day basis? Well, we're going to do that here in just a few moments. One way that we encourage and build each other up is by taking communion together. Reminding ourselves and others of Jesus' death and resurrection, his forgiveness of sins, and his empowerment for service. So I'm going to ask that you would take your emblems today, whatever you happen to have on hand, your, your bread, your cracker, your juice, um, your water, your coffee, whatever you have happened on hand. Um, the idea is that we're using these as some symbols declaring Christ's death and resurrection. And he says over in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 23, he says, For I received from the Lord what I also delivered unto you, that the Lord on the night when he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it, and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in the remembrance of me. Take the cup, if you, or the bread, if you will, and hold it in your hand. You know, this bread is just a symbol of Christ's broken body. How he was whipped, how he was beaten, how he went to the cross of Calvary and there was nailed to that cross and hung there for hours and died there at the cross. It's him going to the cross and taking our place for our sin. It says in the word that the wages of sin is death. That sin causes us separation, spiritual death from God. And God wants us to have a relationship with him. That's why he gave us Jesus to be our sacrifice, if you will, who willingly laid down his life that we might have life and life more abundantly. He says that we should, before taking the, the emblems, that we should evaluate our life. And I want you just to take a moment and close your eyes, if you will, and just allow the Spirit of God to move on you. Do you have any under confess sin? Give that to Him right now. Oh, you don't have to go and list every single one. Just Say, God, forgive me of my sins. And he will. Be sincere. So let's wait for a moment, shall we? Father, we thank you for sending your son Jesus to die for us. We do sin on a daily basis, some intentionally, some um, we're not even aware that we're doing sometimes. And Lord, we ask you to forgive us of our sins, to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And Lord, we take this bread, which is symbolic of the body of your son Jesus and how he laid down his life for us, how he was um, nailed to the cross and there he died. 
Lord, when we take this bread, we're declaring not only his death, but we're declaring his resurrection. That him being buried in a tomb and three days later rising again. He is a living God. He's not a dead God. He's a living God. And he is there for us to bring us into relationship with you. To strengthen us. To give us hope. To give us peace. And we declare that today as we take this bread together. Bless it now for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's take the bread together, shall we? Paul continues on in verse 25 in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. He says, in the same way, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant of my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Father, we thank you for this cup that we have. Lord, we ask that you would just remind us of this new covenant in your blood that we have with you. This covenant of forgiveness, this covenant of hope, this agreement of, of peace in our life. It says in your word that it's by your stripes, by your blood, if you will, that we are healed. And Lord, many of us are sick or ailing in our body. We need healing. So just as you came to bring us into a right relationship with you, that you gave us salvation, so you give us healing. So Lord, we not only receive this morning as we take this cup, your salvation, but we also receive your healing in our body. And we ask that whatever is going on in our bodies would be healed in Jesus' name as we take communion together today. Bless this cup as we receive your love, your forgiveness, your healing. In Jesus' name. Amen. Let's take the cup together, shall we? You know, in the days ahead, we're going to talk a little bit more about sharing uh, the good news of Jesus with those around us. Amen. We need to be ready, but we want others to be ready for the Christ's return. And that's what we've been talking today about, haven't we? About Christ's return, about watching, about waiting, about working, and doing the things that God's called us to do. Now, my friends... I ask that in the name of Jesus, that you would go in peace. That God will bless you and keep you. That God will strengthen you. That he'll turn his face towards you and be attentive to your prayer. That he'll expand your territory and give you peace.